time out of their busy schedules to participate and lend some of their insights uh, today's, to today's conversation. So we only have about an hour together to explore what I think is a very interesting and important question, which is what will the food system look like in the post-fossil fuel future? So we'd like to jump right in, but before we do, I just want to say a few words about the context for this discussion and, and a little bit about how it's going to work. So first, the context. Uh, over the last year, Post Carbon Institute has undertaken a deep dive analysis of the challenges and opportunities that are inherent in the transition to 100% renewable energy, uh, which is a, a call that I think a lot of people are getting behind, recognizing the, the imperative uh, from the climate crisis. Um, so the outcome of that analysis is a book just published with our friends at Island Press called Our Renewable Future. And you can order the book or read the entire contents of the book entirely online at ourrenewablefuture.org. One of the key takeaways from our analysis is that the transition to 100% renew renewable energy won't be a plug and play substitution. It's going to require us to use energy very differently in all aspects of life. So over the coming weeks, Post Carbon Institute is hosting discussions with experts in various sectors to explore what the fossil fuel, post fossil fuel future might look like. Um, so you could sign up for upcoming discussions also by visiting ourrenewablefuture.org. Now, ultimately, this future is going to be created by all of us together, and so we want to hear from you as well. So if you have any questions for our panelists or thoughts to share, please ask them in the chat window that's on your screen at the bottom. And we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can, given that we only have an hour. Now, if you have any thoughts and ideas and inspirations, you can also share these by emailing us at orf at postcarbon.org or by tweeting with the hashtag, hashtag renewable future. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Mike, Michael Bomford is a faculty member in the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Program at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia, where he focuses on organic and sustainable agriculture systems suitable for adoption by small farms operating with limited resources. His projects examine practical ways to reduce food system energy use and to meet farm energy uh, farm energy needs using renewable resources produced on the farm. Mike is also a Post Carbon Institute fellow uh, or Agriculture and Energy Fellow, and he's the person that I always turn to when I have a question about the energy and agricultural nexus. Um, and Tom Philpot is Food and Agriculture Correspondent for Mother Jones, where he writes the weekly Food for Thought blog online, and he contributes features and editorials to the bi-monthly print magazine as well. Uh, Tom was a co-founder in, in 2004 of Maverick Farms, a small organic vegetable farm and center for sustainable farm education, food education in North Carolina, and he serves on the advisory board there. Tom has worked as a professional journalist for over 20 years now, and he's currently based in Austin, Texas. So Mike and Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mike, I want to start with you. Uh, can you please describe the role that energy, and in particular fossil fuels, play in the modern industrial food system? Yeah, I, I think that uh, looking at the American food system it offers a lot of, of uh, opportunity for, for insight into how an industrial food system works. And there's a, a team of economists uh, led by a fellow named Patrick Canning, uh, the, the USDA Economic Research Service, who analyzed energy use in the American food system. They found that about 16% of the energy used by the entire nation went into feeding people. Uh, and that's a, that's a lot of energy. It comes to about 35,000 food calories per person per day. And you compare that to about 2,600 calories of actually available food. And you can see there's a huge difference. You know, we're, we're looking maybe 13 times more energy going into the system than we get out from eating uh, food. In fact, we'd be far better off if we could just uh, eat the fossil fuels. We'd, we'd use a whole lot less energy than, than eating the food the way we produce it and distribute it right now. So the question is, where is all that energy used? And, uh, and it might be a, a little surprising to, to find that farming, agriculture, isn't a huge piece of the whole food system energy picture. So uh, uh, overall, we're looking at about a gallon of crude oil equivalent used each day to feed Americans. Of that, maybe two, two and a quarter cups of crude oil equivalent 
would go to farming, to actually running all of the, the farms in the country. Uh, so remember, 16 cups to the gallon. And when I'm talking crude oil equivalent, I'm talking the energy that you would get from burning that crude oil. It doesn't necessarily mean that all that energy comes from crude oil. Some could from natural gas or from coal or, or what have you. We look at the, the food processing sector. So this is the, the cooking and the dicing and the baking and the, uh, the spam making and all of that sort of thing. And, uh, and we're looking three, three and a quarter cups of crude oil equivalent. So more, 50% more energy going into food processing than to actually producing the food through farming. Packaging, we're looking at about a cup of crude oil equivalent. Um, the freight system, hauling this food uh, around the country and hauling all of the, uh, uh, the precursors, the, uh, the inputs necessary for agricultural production and the food system support, just two thirds of a cup of uh, crude oil equivalent, which is sometimes surprising. I think a lot of people intuitively think that moving products around is going to be a huge part of that whole food system energy picture. In fact, it doesn't end up being, being a, a big, big chunk. But then we look at the, uh, the retail establishment, our grocery stores, our uh, wholesalers, all of the refrigeration, the heating necessary to, uh, to maintain those establishments, uh, two and a third cups of crude oil equivalent going into that. Uh, operating our restaurants and cafeterias, again, it's the, it's the stoves, it's the, uh, the lights, the heat, all of the, keeping those operations going, about two cups, so about as much going into our, our uh, food service establishments as our farms. And then the, the big surprise, perhaps, is the, uh, uh, the energy that goes into household use. So, so this is keeping our kitchens going, uh, heating the water for our, our dishwashers, running our stoves and our refrigerators, but also taking the trip to the grocery store in the, in the, uh, the family car. We're looking four and two thirds cups of crude oil equivalent going into that, uh, uh, that aspect of the system. So twice as much going into our households to feed ourselves as going into our farms. So it's, it's an energy intensive system and maybe where the energy is actually going is, is a bit counterintuitive. Thanks, that's interesting. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit, uh, Tom, about sort of the, the environmental and, and health impacts of the industrial food system, just so we get a, a sense of, of that side of the equation as well. Yeah, sure. Let me let me start by talking about the environmental impacts. And um, one of the things that I've been doing for the past couple of years is sort of looking at the United States map in terms of where the food is grown. And if you look at it that way, you know, basically on the on the left side in the West in California mainly is where the great really the great bulk of our fruit and vegetable production comes from. And then the center of the country in the Midwest, what we call the Corn Belt is really where our meat comes from. That's where we grow most of the corn and soybeans that um, are, are used as animal feeds. And that's where we, a lot of the feedlots are as well for, um, for, for pork and, and beef at least. And so these two regions are really, really critical. And um, one thing I've been uh, sort of noticing and writing about and documenting is that both of these areas are in the middle of sort of long-term slow motion ecological crises. Um, in terms of California, the fruits and vegetables, basically what you've got is this massive concentration in California. And it's easy to see why, because it's got a Mediterranean climate. It, um, it's you know, basically a year round growing season, um, very dry, which means low pressure up for diseases and pests. And so it sort of makes sense that this industry grew up there. Um, the limiting factor, of course, being water, which has been very much in the headlines for the past couple of years because of the California drought. But independent of the California drought, the food system there, the farming system there, is way overstripping the water resources. Um, basically, the 20th century, when they built out the massive amount of infrastructure to get water from the Sierra Nevada mountains into the, the Central Valley, this, you know, basically, the, the, the mountains capture snow, it melts, and then there's this massive federally and state funded infra infrastructure system that goes into distributing that water when it melts into farms. Um, was a very, the 20th century was a very wet century, if you look at the sort of grand scheme of things. And there's a paleoclimatologist at Berkeley who's been you know, looking at tree ring records. His name is Lynn Ingram. And what she has found is that if if you look at the sort of over time, the 20th century, 
um, the, the mean century uh, for the last many uh, is about 15% lower than the 20th century. So it looks like we had this very wet period. And if we revert to mean, which we may be doing, then you're talking about 15% fewer water resources, 15% less water resources. And then when you add climate change to that, so this is sort of independent of climate change. But when you add climate change to that, what that does is, is you get a shift from, um, uh, from snow to rain. Uh, and uh, it turns out that snow is this great agricultural resource in California. Rain, not so much. Snow, you, you can hold it. It melts predictably, and it goes into these channels and is distributed. Uh, water runs off much more easily. And so we're going to get a shift. We're probably going to have fewer water resources coming down, and we're going to have uh, more of it to be rain in, in, instead of snow. And so significantly less water resources going into California. And the way that uh, the food system, the farm system is made up for it there is by tapping wells into the ground and sucking up uh, groundwater. Uh, the groundwater in the Central Valley is this incredible resource that theoretically should serve as a kind of backstop for, for drought years. But it is being drawn down steadily over the decades. Uh, and when we go through non-drought periods, it's not being replenished, uh, not nearly as much as it's coming back. And so you've got a state that is overstripping its water resources that is the state where we grow our food. And you know you can divide California up into the Central Valley, um, the Salinas Valley um, out um, where, you know, uh, on the water uh, in Central California, and the Imperial Valley down in the, uh, in the desert, the very, very southern part of California. Each of them have their own massive water challenges. And each of them, and we can talk about more about it later, are overstripping them. And you know, because of the new groundwater uh, law that California put into place about a year and a half ago, they're going to have to come to terms with this overdraft of groundwater in the Central Valley. And it's going to, as a nation, we're going to have to reckon with this. There's, we're going to have to make some adjustments. Um, and so in California, you know, basically, it's using water faster than, um, than is naturally being replenished. And that's causing all kinds of ecological problems. The Central Valley is subsiding. It's literally sinking. And as it sinks, um, it does it at, uh, at a different pace and different areas. And so you get destruction of infrastructure, including irrigation uh, infrastructure compounding the problem. Um, you get less ability to hold groundwater later when you get a wet year. Uh, you get uh, salinification. Uh, so all that's happening in California. Um, when you go to the Midwest, uh, in you know, let's say Iowa as the sort of epicenter, what you have there is a slow motion soil crisis. So what you have there is that uh, because of the sort of duo cropping of corn and soybeans and growing the same thing every year, year after year, and expanding out um, and putting new land into production, which happened in the sort of ethanol years of the mid mid 2000s and until a couple of years ago, um, you had this expansion into, fra into fragile lands and you get a massive erosion. And uh, there's a scientist at Iowa State University who I've been talking to who uh, sort of documents this. And what, what he says is that if you ask the USDA, if you go to their official stats, the, in Iowa, you lose about five tons per acre of topsoil a year in erosion. And the, the natural replenishment rate is about five tons a year. And so you're in rough balance. The erosion rate, they say, is like 5.2 tons, let's say, and the, the replenishment rate is five tons. So you're in rough balance. There's a little bit at the margins you have to take care of, but there's not a big crisis. And what the scientist, Richard Cruz, says is that that accounting system is not accounting for a kind of erosion called gully erosion. And this is what happens when you get strong storms. And this is where you get a sort of a climate angle. When you get big storms in the Midwest, you get these massive gullies that dig into the land and clear huge amounts of soil off. And the USDA doesn't account for it in its, uh, in its measures. And he is working on accounting for it. And his early estimates that, that he's reporting to me and, and putting in scientific papers and whatnot is that the erosion rate in Iowa as a whole averaged out over years is more like 15 tons per acre. And so you're three times faster than the replenishment rate. But then it gets, I'm sorry, it's, um, it's around seven and a half. 
it's around seven and a half tons per acre. So you're significantly higher than the replenishment rate. But then he also says that new science is coming in that says that the replenishment rate has been way overestimated, and he puts it at closer to a half a ton per acre. And so that's where you get the 15 figure, where basically it looks like losing soil in Iowa, in the heartland, at about 15 times the rate that it's being replenished. And as you lose soil, um, we'll talk later about the potential for carbon sequestration in soil. But as you lose it, you're also losing that ability. Um, and then, you know, getting back to environmental problems, you're, that, wa that soil as it washes away doesn't just disappear. It um, carries away with it all kinds of chemicals, fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, uh, herbicides. And, uh, and so basically all over the Midwest, in every municipality that, uh, that relies on uh, water downstream from the ag system is having a crisis in uh, nitrates uh, in the water supply, in uh, phosphorus blooms, in lakes that create a, a toxin that gets into water. So in the Midwest, there's this massive uh, water crisis generated by ag that is, the root of it is a soil crisis. And then, you, you know, you get into existential issues, like how long can you keep losing soil at that rate when this is the most productive and important farmland in the country. So I'm going to I'm going to end my little spiel there and it looks really dire and doomsday but we can talk about uh, how it doesn't have to be that way and there are actually lots of practical solutions to this and even things going on on the ground already that um, that address these problems that and so I'm giving you sort of a big macro look. Yeah, thanks. And just a, a just a quick follow-up on that. When you look at, at a lot of these environmental issues related to the, the modern ag system, uh, in terms of water and soil and, and, uh, and all that, how much of that would you say is directly related to the, the energy, you know, the, the energy system and, and, how, and how much of the agricultural system is, is, is related to the use of fossil fuels? Well, I would say that the... Can I... Yeah, well, sure. You can you can go in, Michael. Then I'll, I'll come in in a sec. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I, I really appreciated your run, on the, and I'm really uh, I'm pleased to see you bringing climate change into the whole conversation here. And I think you're you're asking a really important question, uh, Sherry. Um, yeah, it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because in most of our society, most of our economy, there's a very uh, direct link between consumption of fossil fuels and uh, um, and greenhouse gas emissions. Our greenhouse gas emissions are mostly carbon dioxide that comes from burning fossil fuels. In agriculture, it's a different story. And so I, off the bat, said, well, honestly, our farms aren't using that much energy relative to the whole food system, but our farms are responsible for far more greenhouse gas emissions than you would expect based on our energy use. Because the greenhouse gas emissions are, are the, the carbon dioxide that's coming out of our farms is mostly due to land use change. And so this is carbon that had been stored in the soil and, uh, and is being emitted from the soil. It's not necessarily carbon that comes from burning fossil fuels. So if we clear land, if we clear grasslands and turn them into uh, farmland, if we clear forests and turn it into farmland, if we lose soil the way Tom is talking about, that's emitting carbon at, from the soil into the atmosphere. And the soil is this huge pool of carbon that, uh, that's uh, moving up into the atmosphere there. So that's the biggest source of carbon dioxide from agriculture, not burning fuel for energy use. And then the, the other major emission sources are actually methane and nitrous oxides that are So the nitrous oxide is mostly coming from soil management and from our, our use of um, nitrogen fertilizer. Michael's breaking up. Yeah, I think we lost Michael. Oh, That's man, he too, was on a roll. He was on a roll. Let's see <laughs> if we can get his connection back going. Um, while we're waiting for Michael to hop back on, I'd be, I'd be curious to get your, your take, Tom, on that question of sort of the... Yeah, I loved where he was going with that. Um, with, and it was kind of in a similar place to where I was going. And, and that is a lot of the... A lot of the energy use that he mentioned that you know the, that two cups out of the 16 out of the gallon um, that does go to agriculture um, a, a significant portion of it comes from from production of nitrogen fertilizer 
And then you get the downstream effect of the, you know, it both leaches into waterways and, and causes water pollution and all sorts of problems on, on down to the Gulf of Mexico, the giant, you know, you know massive dead zone. Um, but it also volatilizes into nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas, Michael, 300 times, close to 300 times more, uh, more powerful uh, than, than carbon. And the system that we use there, the sort of uh, corn soy duopoly, even though soybeans are a, a legume and, and fixed nitrogen, the, the combined system is a massive, massive, massive user of nitrogen fertilizers. So it's got the effect of uh, creating uh, emissions when it's, when it's created, and then it's got this secondary effect of creating uh, uh, nitrous oxide emissions. And, um, and it, it, it turns out that, you know, we can talk about this in a second, but there are all kinds of ways of eliminating uh, or at least greatly decreasing the, the necessity for using all of that uh, nit uh, nitrogen fertilizer. But if you are going to keep the system going as it is, there's no way to do that. So you, you need some fundamental changes that, that we can talk about uh, in a second. Thanks. And Michael, go back Mike. to where you were because you were, yeah, you, were, we lost you were in a good place. Right, right. Well, thanks so much for uh, for covering while I dropped out there. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I'm really glad that you followed up on the the nitrous oxide situation and the whole relationship to uh, to nitrogen fertilizers. That's a very important piece of this puzzle. And, and then the other piece, of course, is methane. Uh, we have a lot of methane emissions from agriculture. Some of them are coming from our soil management, particularly if we have flooded soils or a lot of, uh, of water in our soils. And that whole pattern uh, moving from wet to dry, uh, it creates a, an environment that's suitable for methane production. And then a lot of our methane is coming from our livestock production systems, particularly ruminant digestion. So by ruminants, I'm talking about uh, cattle and sheep and uh, well, deer, there's, there's a bunch of uh, of ruminants um, and and then also from manure management so if we have pools of manure for example that's a wonderful source of both nitrous oxides and methane mm -hmm. and, and so when you look at our greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture it comes down to oh about a third carbon dioxide from land use change about a third maybe a, a quarter methane and a, a a fifth nitrous oxide and the carbon dioxide from fossil fuel consumption is just a tiny tiny sliver of the whole picture so uh, um so in most of society if we can transition to renewable energy sources we're going to deal with the greenhouse gas emissions problem that's not true for agriculture. Simply uh, switching to renewable energy still leaves us with this huge greenhouse gas emission problem. Mm -hmm. sure. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, just a quick... Michael, wouldn't you say that it, if we were to switch to renewable energy, something like the production of nitrogen fertilizer at the scale that it's happening now probably, probably wouldn't be too, too smart or, or possible? Because it is a massive user of energy. Yes, yes. Nitrogen fertilizer is a big user of energy. We look at that agriculture energy picture, maybe as much as a third of it is simply fixing nitrogen fertilizer. And that's in, in North America, that's usually done with natural gas. In China, it's being done with coal. So, so there's a clear link between um, uh, nitrogen fertilizer production and uh, agricultural energy use. Uh, can we do that with renewable fuel sources? Probably not, and probably incorporating nitrogen fixing crops into our rotation is a, a, a much more practical way of, uh, of providing the nitrogen that we need. And certainly also uh, uh, learning to grow in perhaps more nitrogen restricted environments and choosing crops that are, uh, are more efficient users of nitrogen is also a, a potential solution. But all of those solutions require more land. And, uh, and there's, there's a challenge. We can't, I don't think it's um, feasible to maintain current yields without synthetic nitrogen fertilizer fixation. Um, I want to circle back for a second because we have a number of participants, it looks like, who are not in the U.S. We talked a little bit about uh, the situation specifically in the U.S. And we could, we could spend our entire time together talking about uh, what agriculture looks like around the world, but just maybe a quick comment from you, Mike, and, and tell me if you have anything to add, just around what that, you know, when you broke down sort of the energy, uh, you know, food connection in the U.S. in terms of the sort of cup breakdown, 
What would you say about uh, other areas of the world, like the European Union, or I mean, obviously it's very different in places like Africa and maybe parts of Asia. Yeah. But can you yeah. talk about that just real briefly? I, I think that the food system as a whole is probably more in, more energy intensive in the United States than in most of the rest of the world. Uh, and, and certainly when we look at developing nations, the food system energy use is much, much lower than in, uh, in industrialized economies. Uh, now when we start to look at, the, there's all sorts of trade-offs uh, between say land, labor, energy use efficiency, and where North American agriculture has really excelled is in its labor use efficiency. We, uh, we need very few people or we use very few people to, uh, to produce our food. Uh, you know, we're actually not that bad when it comes to energy use efficiency. Some of the, as for example, European models that are often held up as, as examples of where we need to be in terms of small-scale food production are actually far more energy intensive than, uh, than the North American model. And so that's, a, that's an issue and that's, a, that's a, perhaps a concern. Um, and I think that it, it's really important, uh, and, and I suppose that it's, it's really important to keep the greenhouse gas picture in this whole in this whole uh, discussion, because even when we look at developing economies where the food system uses far less energy, that food system is still a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, as a total of the whole economy, the agricultural production system and the food system is a, a larger proportion of greenhouse gas emissions in the developing economies than in uh, in these industrialized economies. Well, anything to add to that, Tom? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, and that's you know part of the reason is that. Um, our economy is so big and so energy intensive outside of food. We have so we, you know, we we have we put so much energy into into, into transportation. Everyone's got a car here, and in places um, like Africa, places where car ownership is a lot a lot lower, other sectors are using less energy, and so the the food sector becomes a bigger a bigger player. Well, Absolutely. Yeah. So we talked to you guys touched up on this a little bit already. This. Um, when we're talking about uh, the challenge with nitrogen production uh, and also land use. Um, but when you think about the transition to 100% uh, renewable energy system and uh, in its relationship with food production and agriculture, you know, what do you see as some of the, the, the challenges in thinking about uh, how, we, how we're using renewable energy and, and the substitution of uh, fossil fuels with renewable energy as it relates to food. So let's start with you, Tom, and then we'll go to you, Michael. Some of the challenges in the, the, the transition. Um, well, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, I guess I want to first define the problem as this sort of uh, you know, steady reduction in diversity, in biodiversity, in the in the ag system, to the point where, and also sort of this de-regionalization where you get this you know massive concentrations in in certain places. Um, and if I want to go ahead and define the problem in the Midwest as we've basically come down to two crops uh, in the Midwest, a little bit to the west, to the west wheat, um, but in, you know, for the most part in the West, we're down to corn and soybeans. Uh, it wasn't always that way. It's gotten more, th more that way with time, um, and it's gotten more that way in the last 10 years because of the ethanol program. And so I think that one of the real keys, and um, and I'm uh, and I'll talk about how we could change that in in some really smart ways, but the blockage to changing that I think is that there are a lot of economic interests that make a lot of money uh, uh, selling inputs into that system, uh, buying outputs and turning it into you know feedlot and meat and things like that. There's a lot of economic interests uh, lined up in that. And uh, these are very concentrated industries. Um, the, the input industry uh, globally, I think this is a stunning number, um, if Bayer ends up buying Monsanto, um, is, you know, basically we're looking at a deal where it looks like Monsanto is going to be bought by either BASF or Bayer, these two giant uh, uh, German chemical companies. And if mm -hmm. one of those deals goes through, we'll have four seed and pesticide companies 
um, with nearly or more than 60% of both the seed and pesticide markets globally. And it's, the numbers are even higher in the United States. Um, so this is a, these are very concentrated industries in, uh, in meat production and things like bee and beef, four companies own 90% of the market. Um, in chicken and, and, uh, and pork, it's uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And so you get these really concentrated industries that are benefiting from this system, and they clearly are going to invest some of their profits in things like lobbying. And, um, and I, you know, I think we've got a, um, a very long, you know, I would say since the 70s, if not earlier, logjam in farm policy in the United States, where we can make changes to it, and we can, we can do these little reforms to the margin, but we don't change it in ways that that challenge these interests. And these are very, very powerful players in, in this conversation. And they have a stake in the way things are. And I think that is a big uh, impediment. OK, so that you, you're, you're naming the sort of political uh, and, and sort of corporate uh, obstacle to that transition. Yeah. Mike, what about, what about some of the more energy related you know, challenges or, or some of the other areas that, that might be difficult to to do this transition or have a or have a food system that operates the way it currently does, just right. having substituted renewables. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think that, I, you know, Richard Heinberg's book has done a really good job of demonstrating that there aren't easy plug and play solutions. We can't easily move from the existing energy system to some renewable uh, uh, renewable energy system in, in a lot of situations. When we're talking about energy, I think it's really important to recognize that we're talking about mostly the energy used after the farm gate, if we're concerned about energy in the food system. And so uh, the energy transfer transition in this food system really relates to the way our cities are built, the way our homes are built, the way we get to the grocery store and things like this. It doesn't necessarily relate to our farms specifically. Now we're we're heading up against two brick walls, aren't we? There's the there's the brick wall related to uh, decline of easily accessible uh, fossil energy sources, and then there's the brick wall related to um, carbon dioxide and, and greenhouse gas emissions and uh, and this warming climate. And I think that I uh, that we're we're approaching the climate wall faster than we're approaching the uh, the energy uh, wall. And unfortunately, we still have enough energy to roast the planet. And so we have to really focus on our, uh, our greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction strategy as a top priority. And so when it comes to agriculture, I think if we're talking about renewable agriculture, we need to focus on reducing those greenhouse gas emissions and think very much as Tom has pointed out, Think about using renewable water sources. So, for example, tapping into ground or to surface water as opposed to groundwater sources. Think about renewing our soil. So, if we have, if we're depleting our soil resources, uh, that's clearly not sustainable, and that's as much a problem or more of a problem than uh, than than our dependence on non-renewable energy sources. Uh, you know, there's there are a lot of resources involved in producing food and in, in farming. Uh, energy is only one of them, and I almost want to argue that it's not uh, not the big one that we need to worry about if we're concerned about renewable food systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, you point out the that uh, these are systems that are inter interrelated, right? So when you're Absolutely. when you're talking about uh, energy use in the food system and, and how it actually relates to land use and transportation and the home energy use and all those things. Um, sure. But there's also, when you're talking about our strategy to mitigate, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and reduce them, there's a lot of, uh, of discussion and plans that really emphasize biomass as a strategy for doing that. Mm. And that is a direct implication, obviously, on food production and agriculture. So, yeah, I'm yes. curious to, to hear what you guys think about that. Are we, are, are those feasible? Are those sustainable? What is the, what would the pressures be uh, being put on growing enough food for a population that's supposed to grow to 9 billion people, you know, or more? I think it is greatly, greatly exaggerated. I think the, the importance of, of bio, I don't know what Michael thinks. Maybe we'll have a debate. Uh, or, or not, but um, I think that um, 
that biomass, I mean, there are different ways to use it. Um, the way that we've done it here in the United States so far has been to take food and process the hell out of it and turn it into liquid fuel to power um, combustion engines. And I think that that I think any sane person can look at that and say that that it's insane. Um, that that doesn't make any sense. Um, that you know the the corn ethanol program. I think we can just sort of knock off the table as anything uh, sensible. Even though for you know, depending on how you account for um, byproducts, between thirty three and forty percent of our corn uh, supply is going into it. Um, it's ridiculous. Um, then you get to cellulosic ethanol and. To me, I think the key, the key thing to think about here is that biomass is not energy dense. It's bulky. It's heavy. It's hard to move around. Um, and I think one of the key things is that you're not going to replace something like petroleum, which is, you know, lots and lots and lots of biomass over lots and lots of time concentrating into a very powerful fuel with biomass that was grown yesterday. It's just, you know, it's just not going to work. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's overblown. And I think that people who, who really push it, who have historically pushed it, when they didn't have an economic interest in it, they don't get how farming works. They don't get that how bulky biomass is. They don't get that farming is this, um, this process that has all these impacts on soil, on greenhouse gas emissions, and, and things like that. Having said all that, I think that in some regions, in some places, it might make sense to do something like burn biomass and generate electricity with it, where you get a straight, you go straight from biomass to electricity, and not through this kind of insane process of turning it into a liquid fuel with fermentation and distillation and, and, and all of that. So I, I think there, that there, there may be a place for it at the margin. Uh, but the idea, I mean, you know, you guys were around in 2003, 2004, 2005 during that sort of mania for biofuel when oil prices are really high. Um, I think all of that sort of uh, biofuel hysteria has been discredited. And, you know, we still haven't seen commercially viable cellulosic ethanol, not for lots and lots of government investment and subsidy. And, and I'm not against government investment and subsidy. I just think that happens to be a, a, a bad one. I'm curious what you think, Michael. Yeah, I'm afraid you're not going to get a debate from me. I, I, I agree with what you're saying uh, pretty much 100%. <laughs> I, I, I agree that there may be a place for some biomass to energy, but it's going to be at the margins. Uh, we can't substitute biofuels for our existing uh, uh, petroleum use. I, I want to emphasize that really this, um, this transformation of solar radiation into chemical energy uh, that's conducted through photosynthesis in plants is an incredibly yeah. inefficient process. So, so typically, we're looking at about 0.1 to maybe 2% efficiency of, of this conversion of solar radiation to, uh, to chemical energy. Uh, and if you look at the whole planet and all of the photosynthesis that's happening on this planet, it averages out to about 1% efficiency. Some of our crops are a little more efficient. We might get 1% to 2% for, say, corn and, and some of our, our agricultural crops. Sugarcane looks pretty good at maybe 7 to 8%. But that's what we're starting out with. If we're trying to capture sunlight and turn it into chemical energy, plants don't do it with any kind of efficiency. And then we have to recognize that you're taking that chemical energy, and I agree, probably just burning the biomass to make electricity is the most efficient thing we can do at this point. Certainly making it into uh, ethanol or biodiesel is a very energy inefficient trans, uh, transformation. We, uh, but we need to recognize that even that combustion to electricity, we're looking at about 30% efficiency. So we start with 1% and then 30% of 1%. And it all comes with all of these other resources that are necessary. So you need the land, you need the soil, you need the water, you need a, an appropriate climate to grow the stuff. You need nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium, calcium, boron, magnesium, molybdenum, manganese, copper, zinc. You need all of this stuff in order to use photosynthesis as your uh, pathway for transforming energy into some useful form. It's not going to work. 
We compare this with, say, commercial solar cells that at the moment we're looking typically 5 to 20 percent efficiency, which looks tremendous compared to any kind of biomass mediated uh, uh, form of, of energy transformation. Uh, ethanol and biodiesel on a small scale, making use of waste products, I think there's a place for it. Methane digestion, I think, is a really good idea because we've got the double benefit of um, cleaning up one of our potent greenhouse gases and producing a bit of energy. But we're not going to produce nearly enough to, uh, to substitute for our current energy consumption. Yeah, thank you. So let's, let's flip it around and, and look at what are some of the low-hanging fruit or most exciting opportunities uh, in terms of trying to actually, you know, do this transition. And, and uh, we're talking, I think, about recognizing that we have an agricultural system, an industrial agricultural system, particularly in the, in the developed world, that's unsustainable in its own right. And then we have an energy system that needs to go through transition. So when you look at the sort of intersection between those things, what are you most excited about? What do you feel like is a low-hanging fruit that we should be focusing on? Uh, what are the, the greatest opportunities for us? Well, let me, I'm going to take a, a cue from, from Michael and, and kind of rephrase the, the question around, I mean, I think for agriculture, and I think Michael's done a great job of teasing out the way that energy, that there's this paradox in agriculture where it doesn't use much energy, but it spews out a lot of greenhouse gas. And it's also very, we haven't even talked about how it's vulnerable to climate change, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's, it's, clearly, there's a lot of things that make it vulnerable to climate change. And so why don't we ask um, what would be, how could we co create a climate resilient agriculture that goes light on the greenhouse gases? Um, I, I think what might be a way to, way to think about it. And when I think about that, I think about um, two things. One is a, a study, I think uh, a very, very important study that came out in 2012 uh, by researchers at Iowa State, um, where they looked at with test plots in Iowa, the sort of the center of industrial ag, they looked at different farming systems, um, and the key variable that they played around with was diversity. And so what they did was they they looked at the regular system of let's say corn. Corn, soy, corn. That's your rotation. You do two years of corn, one year of soybeans. And then they, so you've got a two crop rotation. And then they start adding crops to it. They start adding things like oats or wheat, uh, what are known as small grains. And what they, and you know, alfalfa um, as well. And, and what they find is that the more crops that you rotate in, uh, the less, what you're doing when you, when you have a monocrop, you're inviting in all the things that like to eat that crop. You're giving them a great um, habitat. And so when you put, um, you know, something like 170 million acres of corn and soybeans in, mostly in the middle of the country, all the things that like to feast on those things are, are having a party. And so you need all kinds of, of pesticides and, and, and fungicides and herbicides. And then you also, uh, you're taking the same things out of the soil every year, so you have this predictable need to replenish the soil uh, every year with things like nitrogen and phosphorus and, and, um, and you know, those uh, key fertilizers. And so what these guys find is that when you diversify, you disrupt all those patterns and you are taking things out of the soil, but you're also putting things back into the soil. And they found that the the more diverse the system, by adding one crop and then two crops to it, you use a fraction of the herbicides and pesticides. And that leads to um, cleaner water. There's, uh, they, they, they tested water coming off of these things and much, much cleaner water. Um, and critical to our discussion, uh, a massive drop in the need for uh, fertilizers. Um, and and not, just, uh, not just nitrogen, but also the other two, because as you as you build, uh, um, as you diversify, you also diversify soil microbes. You get a different set of soil microbes, and the soil microbes are good at taking phosphorus that's already in the soil that's been applied over all these years and making it available. And so you get uh, a much more efficient system. And to the Post Carbon Institute's fixation, half of the energy uh, use they found. And they, they, they found that um, 
in the conventional system, the biggest energy user was the fertilizer, was the nitrogen fertilizer. And when they, they eliminated, you know, something like 70% of the need for that, um, and importantly, Michael, there was no drop in crop yields. Uh, by diversifying this diversified system, they did not see a, a, a loss in yield. Um, but, uh, but so the, the biggest uh, energy user was, uh, was fertilizer. And when they, um, they, in the more diversified systems where they're using less fertilizer, uh, the biggest energy user was the on-farm the on um, tractors and things like that, which ended up being a, a rather small piece of the puzzle, I think, in, in the end. But you could, you know, you could, there are ways that you could deal with that. Um, and so I think that um, the simple idea of putting in, I think there's two different policies that, that could happen that would be very possible. We, you know, we have strong farm policy policy in this country. We have a farm bill every five years. Two, two things, that, two ways you could do it. You could incentivize diversity. You could say, we'll pay you to diversify your rotations and, and, and grow more stuff. Or, um, you know, the other thing was that these systems uh, 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 sequester more carbon in the soil. And so you could pay farmers to, because I think the technology has gotten very cheap for measuring this. So you create a ba baseline. It's not that hard to measure. You, cr you, you pay farmers by the amount of carbon that they sequester in soils, and that will push them to these practices. And you get a more climate resilient agriculture, less reliant on these energy intensive products like fertilizers and pesticides, um, more water efficient. Uh, one of the things about the Midwest is that most, not all of, but most of the agriculture there is rain fed. And as we get, as climate change proceeds apace, you get more droughts, you get more floods. There is a need to be more rain efficient. And, um, and you know, I visited a farm. I did a, a piece in 2013 about a farmer named David Brandt in Ohio who's basically, he's a corn and soybean farmer, but he also does wheat. Um, and he's, incorpor so he's incorporating his ideas by adding wheat. But what he really focuses on is cover crops in the winter. He uses, ends up using 11 species of cover crops or more, legumes and grasses and tubers. And, um, and what, uh, you know, he is getting, and I visited him in 2013. It was the year after the uh, worst drought in, you know, recent history in the Midwest. And he said that in 2012, because he's got so much organic matter in his soil, he got 80% of his normal yield when all of his neighbors around him either had crop failure or got like 50%. So it, it, this kind of uh, farming makes, uh, makes these farms more resilient to climate and um, they reduce greenhouse gas emissions, they use lower amounts of energy. And on the, on the yield question, Michael, he doesn't sacrifice any, in, in a good year, he's not sacrificing yield compared to his neighbors. And in bad years, he's beating his neighbors in yield. So the, it averages out, he actually does better than them. And so I, I do want to push back a little bit on the assumption that moving to more diversified, less chemical dependent systems, less fertilizer dependent systems necessarily mean lower yield. Maybe they do in some, in some regions, but in the, the Midwest, which is by far our biggest uh, sort of user of nitrogen fertilizer, that isn't necessarily so. Now, I agree there are lots of good examples of people who are, are farming well and able to get excellent yields from um, uh, for, from more renewable systems. I, I think that, um, I, and so I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to push too hard against what, what you're saying. I, I do think though that we see a, uh, a yield benefit from all of the nitrogen that we pour onto our crops and it's not necessarily an efficient use of that nitrogen but you look at uh, for example Chinese yields they're much higher than North American yields they're also much more nitrogen intensive uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, but that, that's neither here nor there I think because I think that you and I are singing from the same songbook when we want to emphasize this the importance of uh, cycling resources and certainly incorporating biodiversity into our farms is a way to retain those resources on our farms. So we are we're not no, we're no longer thinking of agriculture as a sort of flow through system that requires a whole lot of inputs and and has all of these waste products uh, running into our surface waters and our atmosphere. We're instead we're trying to keep those uh, those resources on the farm as long as possible.
I think that a, a, a key piece of low-hanging fruit in, the, in this um, arena is to uh, reintegrate our crop and livestock production systems. Yes. So we have, um, as, as you said, most of our agricultural land in the Midwest is dedicated to producing animal feed and ethanol crops. Uh, this is we're, we're creating a flow through system in that um, most of the that animal feed is going into concentrated livestock feeding operations. These the the resources that come out of the back end of livestock are not making it back onto the farm again, and uh, and we need to tie these pieces of the puzzle back together. We also have to, I think that low-hanging fruit involves moving from uh, the dependence on ruminants to dependence or, or to a greater use of monogastrics, uh, so pigs and chickens as opposed to cattle. That said, I think there's a place for cattle. There's a place for our ruminants, particularly when they're grazing on high quality forages. Uh, the, the high quality can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, the methane emissions from the cattle, and um, and there's that tremendous potential to sequester carbon on these grazing lands. And we don't. Uh, and and when you start to look at the the carbon sequestration, that's that tends to be a bit of a trade off for some of the methane emissions. I, I totally agree with you that we need to figure out a way to price both carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions so that farmers can both see the uh, benefit in terms of financial returns and also pay the price associated with emissions. And so um, uh, it, because there's, our farms have this potential, as you uh, pointed out, to be uh, sinks of these greenhouse gases, to sequester greenhouse gases and to reduce the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we need to be able to reward our farmers for doing that and for farming in a, in a way that does that. So that, that to me is a, a clear piece of low-hanging fruit. Uh, in terms of the, yeah, um, you know. sorry, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> in in terms of the, uh, so those are, and, and I, I think that we have to rely more on nitrogen fixing crops. Whether or not there's a yield reduction, I think that's the way we have to go. We can't depend, uh, we can't continue to depend on um, uh, on synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Um, in, uh, another piece of low-hanging fruit, perhaps, in our agricultural systems globally, maybe not so much in the States, is to uh, investigate dryland rice production. We have a lot of methane coming out of our rice paddies because they're a flooded system. And, uh, uh, and, and when you have these anaerobic conditions in the soil, that produces, uh, produces methane. There's been some really, uh, some really interesting work and success in dryland rice production, so not flooding uh, for weed management. And I think that uh, if we can move in that direction, that's going to have a big impact globally. Um, and then when we look at the whole food system, uh, and perhaps I'll get some, some disagreement here, but I actually see urbanization as a, a good thing. Um, and, uh, and, and I see potential for urbanization to solve some of the problems associated with our energy use because it tends to promote smaller homes. We need more energy efficient homes. Remember that the, the big piece of energy use, the, the uh, quarter of, of energy use in the food system is actually takes place in the home. We need homes that are close to markets and to bodegas so we can have our daily walk to pick up our produce. We're not relying on huge refrigerators at home. Uh, maybe infrequent drives or even cargo bike uh, trips to, um, say, warehouse style stores for bulk items, but those would, be, those would be infrequent, right? We need simpler kitchens. We need smaller, fewer fridges. We need solar hot water heaters on our homes. Uh, so an awful lot of, of reducing the food system energy use comes down to how we design the places that we live. And I think that's that's really important. Our cities are inextricably tied to our farms. Uh, and I question whether cities, for all of their benefits, can persist in deserts. Uh, and I, I think that uh, that's, that's a, I guess, just a question for, for how we move forward. Mm -hmm. I think that in a few cases, it makes sense to um, have our farms very, you know, geographically close to our cities. And this is particularly true for produce farms because produce, uh, and I'm talking fruits and vegetables, mostly water, uh, energy intensive transportation, very different from, trans from moving grain around, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if we're going to have peri-urban agriculture, I think it makes sense to, to really uh, focus on, on vegetable production, fruit production, 
in uh, uh, and this would be open air production or maybe solar greenhouses but I want to just take a moment to, to highlight the incredible energy use that's going into our current greenhouse systems and what I consider just the ridiculous nature of, of some of the uh, visions of vertical farms with uh, that they're very very energy intensive systems and uh, we want to stay away from them if we're concerned about energy use in the food system um, yeah so I guess um, those are I just yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I just read an article today by a guy named John Foley, who was uh, he's at, uh, out in California, and he was mocking this idea of indoor farms because you're, you're basically uh, using energy to, uh, to replace sunlight. Yes. And then the, the indoor farm people say, oh, but we'll just use renewable energy. But now you're using renewable energy, presumably based on solar energy, to recreate sunlight. And it just it doesn't make sense on any level. Yeah. And we no, never hear, we, can, we, we never stop hearing the hype about um, vertical farming. It's just, you know, this mm -hmm. constant hype machine that is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, mean, uh, I really want to really just put a thumbs up on what you, all, everything you said about um, urbanization and creating dense cities and peri-urban farms and, you know, the, just the sheer idiocy of going to a, you know, a Whole Foods and seeing a bag of, organic lettuce in New York that's been trucked all the way across the country from a farm in, in California and kept chilled in this little plastic pod, um, it is absolutely ridiculous. I'll mention really fast that uh, we're actually hosting another conversation uh, uh, next week on communities and the built environment and, and buildings, uh, because you're absolutely right. You know, it's a huge source of of energy use and and emissions, uh, and we have to look at all these systems together. We unfortunately have all very these, few all these systems are very linked. Yeah, we unfortunately have very uh, just a few minutes left, and uh, we're getting a lot of questions from folks around sort of small scale agriculture, which uh, also I think relates to this larger question, which is for our audience members and other people. Uh, like them and, and ourselves, uh, I'll speak for myself, you know, what's our role as, you know, we're consumers of food, obviously, but what's our role as food producers? And, and what do you see as the, in your vision for the future, is it still very, and I guess we're talking about the developed world here, a very corporate dominated, you know, but more uh, greenhouse gas limited uh, and efficient food system, or is it much more small scale? Um, you know, maybe you can answer that question. And also, uh, as we're concluding this conversation, what is your recommendation to folks listening in terms of how they can help this transition of the food system and agriculture uh, towards this 100% renewable future? So, uh, Tom, why don't you go first? OK, I'll go first. Wow, it is a big question. Um, so in terms of how I envision a, sustain, a, a more sustainable future and, and what role consumers can can play in that. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I started off by talking about the concentration in California for in vegetable production, and Michael gave a great um, segue for him about to say about um, how these are things, these are the, the very things that can be grown in and around, in a little bit, but uh, right around cities. And moving towards uh, sort of what I call decalifornifying the food system, and that is yeah. distributing fruit and vegetable production around. And you know the thing about it is, it's not going to be. It's sort of like the energy transition. It's not going to be a one-to-one -one thing. You're not going to have everything you want year-round. I mean, people have been saying this for years, but I think it's it's so important to note that it it can be perfectly pleasurable to have seasons for things. And then there are other things like apples that travel better than, um, than stuff like salad greens. So have a season for salad greens and eat a lot of them in that season and then be happy when they come, when they come back again. Um, supporting, supporting farms, you know, and not just going to the farmer's market and shopping at the farm, but getting involved with the food system in your area. Because, you know, Asher and I were talking before we even came on today about how some of the small scale ag that goes on and even the kind that I did myself in North Carolina can be really inefficient because of the way that we've structured our cities and our even our rural areas where it doesn't make much sense for me to, to 
harvest. I used to, we used to grow a bunch of salad greens on, on that farm and distribute them in a truck. Um, and that makes probably as, as little sense as the Whole Foods model of trucking across from, uh, from, from California. And thinking of ways, getting involved with the food system, talking to farmers, finding out what the, the parts that are, the, the parts in the, in the local food system that are very inefficient for them, because they're probably also very energy intensive, and figuring out community ways to come together and solve that, solve those problems. Things like uh, food hubs, things like you know maybe um, farmer-owned retail or uh, cooperative retail. That instead of um, everyone um, coming to the farmers market, maybe a truck goes around. One truck goes around and picks up vegetables to one densely uh, populated area where there's a, a food co-op. Uh, you know things like that. Figure out how to get involved with the food system, not just as a consumer, but as a citizen in, in terms of policy, in terms of investments, in terms of cooperative projects, um, I, I think are really important. And then I know we're running out of time, so Michael, you jump in. <laughs> well, I, I think you've raised really good points. Um, I, I'm glad to hear you mentioning food hubs. I see this as a way for small-scale producers to gain some of the efficiencies associated with uh, with larger-scale production. I think that you know we're uh, we're in a crisis situation. Things have to change pretty quickly, and I think that the the small-scale producers we need to figure out how to uh, to ramp up small-scale production and take advantages of some of the uh, um, uh, take advantage of of what small-scale production has to offer. We also have to transition these larger the larger-scale production system and work with our larger-scale producers. Uh, and, and they can be a, an important part of the solution and must be an important part of the solution. We can't just uh, uh, believe that, that we can exist with, uh, uh, with, with small-scale production, I think. So, uh, uh, and, and maybe as this transition occurs, um, that we can, we can uh, depend on a greater proportion of small-scale production over time. But we have, to, we have to involve everybody right now to make this work. And I think that one of the principles here is diversity. And I think diversity of scale in the food system is really important. I mean, we've we moved for half a century um, of, we went for half a century where small scale farms and mid-sized farms were being eliminated um, by the thousands every year. Large scale farms were, we had this consolidating system um, and it was the enemy of diversity. And I think now we're in, a, here in the US, we're in a situation where small farms are growing Large farms continue to grow in number, and there's a squeeze in the middle. And if we can get the mid-scale farms to be healthy and to be economically viable and give them incentives to do things in a more ecological way, um, a system that had all three, and I think with small-scale farms focusing on things like produce um, and large, -scale, large and mid-scale farms focusing on things like grain, um, and preferably grain that people eat and not that isn't fed through an animal. Um, I think the things. I, I think that that's a way of looking at it. And diversity across the food system, uh, everywhere, is is one of the one of the major answers. All right. Well, we are at at time. I uh, we could t I could personally talk for at least another hour on the subject. Um, but uh, we're gonna, we're going to call it a day. I want to thank you guys uh, for participating. Really appreciate it, and uh, thank everyone who participated live with us. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of your questions, um, but we will be posting the recording of this video soon and sending out as a link to everybody, as well as a transcript of the chat um, for folks. Um, and uh, and as both Tom and Michael were saying, this is not a transition that's going to happen overnight. So it's going to require a lot of thinking, a lot of experimentation, and a lot of engagement. So I want to support everyone, encourage everyone to be involved, both in terms of thinking about what food that they're consuming, where it's coming from, any potential that they have for, for producing their own food, but then really looking at the, the food system around them and getting involved in both national policy and local policy around those things as well. So um, thank you both, and, uh, and have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank well, thanks, for in yeah, thanks for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Take care, everyone. You too. All right. Bye. -bye.